Hi. Um, I'm a professor of biomedical engineering and I um, have a lab called Computational Cardiology Lab and we work on this digital twin technology. I um, want to first start with sort of touching base of what is actually a digital twin. Digital twin is a replica of a physical entity and it provides not only representation of the different elements but the connection between the elements, dynamic between the components, how the entity functions as being composed of these interrelated parts. So this is a concept that has been used a lot in industry because digital twins are used to optimize operation and maintenance of physical assets. For instance, one can think of a, let's say an MRI machine. They're very expensive and one wants to anticipate uh, the potential of a part failure. So a part can be ordered in advance and replaced before the machine needs to be shut down and there is a wait period while the new part is brought. So this is a concept that is used now, uh, what's called in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, we believe, and this is not just our opinion, but also widely, um, acceptive among people who are looking into the future of healthcare, that the digital twin will be a technology that is most likely to disrupt healthcare because it will enable this continuously adjustable um, personal um, repositories of information. It's basically a representation of the patient or an organ of the patient where all the information continuously comes into this digital entity and it presents all kinds of information about the patient. And that digital twin can be used to decide what would be the treatment, what is the diagnosis and so forth. And it keeps being updated with more information. So I wanna to talk to you about the heart digital twin. Um, back in 2018, this is a screenshot from a, um, a web-based blog from Philips. You can see here their logo on the screen uh, where a virtual heart uh, article was written how a virtual heart could save you real one. Um, in other words, the virtual heart can be used to anticipate the problems with the real one and it can provide new diagnostic approaches and also what would be the appropriate therapy for this patient. And this is entirely the concept of personalized medicine embedded in this. So in my lab, we do this sort of personalized um, medicine in, in regard to cardiology. And we use this digital twin concept in our translational research. And I can divide our clinical translational research into two parts, diagnostics and treatment. And in diagnostics, we mo mostly have predicted um, risks of sudden cardiac death. We are working on predicting of stroke due to arrhythmias also recurrence of disease after treatment. In the treatment part, we are mostly focused on treatment for heart rhythm disorders. And those are ablation guidance for atrial and ventricular um, arrhythmias. And I wanna share one of the studies. We have numerous, so I wanna share just one of those. This was a approach that was recently published in the fall. And um, this was a, as I said, a treatment for heart rhythm disorder that was entirely driven by computation. Basically, we constructed a digital twin of the patient's atria to treat atrial fibrillation, which is the most common human arrhythmia. One to 2% of the human population has that, and it's one of the biggest healthcare expenditures. So we call this approach optimal. Optimal targeting uh, identification, identification via modeling of arrhythmogenesis. So let me tell you what the concept is. So this was a prospective study, entirely driven by simulation. So the patients are treated by threading a catheter in their heart, heart and burning a location which is considered the perpetrator of the arrhythmia. Now, typically that perpetrator is very hard to determine. And what we are doing is we are using a scan of the patient's heart, constructing a digital twin, incorporating information about the functioning of the cells in disease in this patient, 
And then we are predicting the personalized treatment for each patient. And so it was a prospective trial. So the physicians directly navigated the catheter and burned pieces of the heart based on our computational prediction. So let me describe what the, the process incorporates. So first, there is a contrast enhanced MRI of the patient before the procedure. The, we get the, this um, image and then we segment the images, as you can see here. From the segmented image, we reconstruct, those are the two atria of the patients, the upper chamber, chambers of the heart. They incorporate areas of green. These are fibrosis. This is, these are typically patients who have persistent atrial fibrillation. Fibrosis grows in the heart. Also, age leads to that as well. Um, that's why more um, advanced age is associated with a higher probability of fibrosis. And then we calculate the personalized arrhythmias. By poking the heart, the, it, these many, many little locations, and then we elicit these recirculating waves, which are like little hurricanes on the heart. Those are the arrhythmias. And what we're trying to do is to determine which is the main perpetrator. And you can see here a little uh, dot that's going around and around. And this is an organizing center. The, the others are really chaotic, but we are finding one organized center right here. And that's what we are going to target um, with our approach. My um, slide is not advancing for some reason, but we can solve that this way. So um, this was the concept. What we want to do, though, is not just to predict what are, the, um, um, what are these arrhythmias. And then here we are performing, predicting what are the ablation targets. But what we do is a mock-up of the clinical procedure in the model. We perform the ablation, then we predict whether the ablation was done right, whether sometimes, even if you do it right, there are new origins of new perpetrators. And so we perform virtual ablations, then we identify whether there are new targets, new arrhythmias will arise, which is a very common reason why these ablations fails, fail in the patients. And then we predict the new targets and we repeat this until we have a complete inability to induce arrhythmia in this patient heart. And then we export these targets. They are exported in the procedure room and the catheter is navigated to these targets and the treatment is executed. And that's that. Um, so what is the biggest benefit of what we do? I said that when I described the digital twin, the biggest benefit of the digital twin is that it is tailored not only to the patient, but in anticipation of the patient's response, because we are predicting how the patient's heart is going to respond to, to this ablation, to the burning of the piece, and whether new problems will arise. So this is one of the biggest um, advantages of this technology. So let me show you one of our patients. Again, everything is prospective. Everything is driven by simulations. This is the um, atria of this patient. The green is the fibrotic remodeling. This guy had previous ablation unsuccessful. So we took him and we were able to predict here is one arrhythmia on one side on one of the atria. It's a recirculating wave. There is another one on the other side. So we had these two targets shown with circles, and then the physicians basically went there and ablated. And um, here is the next patient. That's another patient, a little bit less fibrosis. Um, here is the, um, the ablation plan. I'm not showing the arrhythmia here, but what appears on the screen during the procedure. And you can see here, these are the targets. Some are connecting lines, so the targets are not disjoint. Everything is calculated, and this we predict that this patient will do very well. And here is the outcome of this prospective study of 10 patients. You can see of all the 10 patients, only one came back for repeat procedure, um, and it was a very simple arrhythmia. Um, and 
um, the particular reason was that the physicians didn't reach to one of the predicted places. Now, I want to tell you, in reality, when this is executed in the cleaning, it is the success of this procedure is between 20 to 40 percent, 20 to 40 percent. We had out of these 10 patients, only one came back and only for very simple touch up. So it was so much better than what was done um, routinely in what is done routinely in the clinic. So what we did is um, these are the advantages. It can guide the ablation. Also, we have offline prediction of targets. We eliminate, are hoping to eliminate these redo procedures, which are huge healthcare ex expense. We have received an FDA approval. We went to the FDA, got an approval for a randomized clinical trial of 160 patients. We registered it on clinicaltrial.gov. It is the only clinical trial that FDA thus far has approved that's entirely driven by computer simulations. The treatment, the actual treatment of the patient is driven by computer simulations. Uh, we had two patients about to enroll and then COVID happened. So this is the optimal approach. We have similar digital twin approaches also for other types of arrhythmias like ventricular arrhythmias. Um, this was a um, year earlier paper and the approach is very sim similar where you use the um, um, image, then you reconstruct a model, then you predict where to ablate and then um, it is done in the clinic. So that works also for ventricular arrhythmias. Um, this is the part of our research that deals with treatment. As I said, uh, we also do diagnostics, which predict risk of sudden cardiac death or um, recurrence of disease. And we had this um, approach that we also had developed for predicting risk of sudden cardiac death. Those were patients that had infarction and we predicted which of them will have um, actually an arrhythmia post infarction. Um, we have, this was published. So this year we expanded that to another very complex disease, many diseases, but I just wanted to show one very complex disease called cardiac sarcoidosis. And this is an inflammatory heart disease. And here in our approach, we combined not um, different types of imaging modalities, not only the contrast enhan enhanced MRI, but also PET scans that show um, inflammation. And then we constructed the mechanistic model and then we combined the mechanistic model with machine learning. We incorporated other um, imaging features and also clinical data of the patient. And we had a very good predictive capability of this model. We called that CHAI. So um, in conclusion, mechanistic modeling, artificial intelligence are major tools in precision cardiology. They will endanger accurate clinical decision-making and lead to reduction in healthcare costs. And we believe that the hard digital twin technology really rules. We also received a funding. We were the first federally funded project at Johns Hopkins on COVID. It, it was funded, it got funded um, about a month and a half by NSF. Um, it is to use machine learning to predict which patients that have COVID heart injury will develop major cardiac events. And um, it took me 12 days between submitting the grant and its funding. And you can see the press release here um, by Hopkins and also it's in the hub. So if you have any questions about that, I also can answer. And I'm gonna finish with this last slide we have uh, what we call an alliance for cardiovascular diagnostic and treatment innovation which is a center that is uh, targeting uh, precision cardiology and if you guys um, want to spend some time looking at our page you're welcome to do so thank you very much great uh thank you natalia um so we have time for one question uh peter weiss asks which, if we go back to the um, the slide where you were showing sort of the waves, uh, the movies with the various waves, which aspects of the wave of arrhythmia sweeping over the heart shows pathology or getting rid of it? Is it the light part, the dark part, something else? So explain that if, we look, if we look at this movie, the pathology is 
the, the green is fibrotic remodeling. However, the waves that are generated, so normal cardiac beat, we have a propagation of a wave through the heart, through the atria. But when you have these regions that are obstacles to propagation, the wave breaks and starts to recirculate. So by looking at this image, we cannot tell what the problem is. If we could, imaging would be sufficient. You would not need the simulations. But you can see it's very distributed and you cannot tell how the wave will behave. Only when we incorporate this image in a geometrical heart model and then we put all the cell behavior, the cells, the way they interact with each other, some are diseased, some are not. When we put all that, that together, this has a, a, a cellular resolution. And when we put that together, we can see only then a wave that gets attached to a particular place. Why there? Why not in the other place? We cannot tell. That's why we need the simulation. I hope that answers the question. Great. Thank you. 